Hello and welcome back to Rays Gaming and a bit more Baldur's Gate 3. With the recent BAFTA award win and the major patch of patch 7 right around the corner, I've had my eyes back on the game again. With that, I wanted to discuss some interesting details that came up over the last little while, some unexpected secrets that I think are particularly useful for new players or people trying a new playthrough. Why would they be doing that? Well, patch 7. So let's do a quick highlight of patch 7 because there's actually some details about it from a recent post. Now, the major thing coming is the new content. Yes, new cinematics, which was very unexpected. Expected, there's new and improved evil endings for the game for the darker playthrough conclusions. Now, obviously, that highlights the dark urge specifically, but in the text, they call out non dirge players for the evil choices. It is good to see some love for these types of playthroughs. I think a lot of people at this point are willing to do the more dastardly, horrible things. It's difficult with the origin companions and some of the options you'll have to do, but it does deserve the same quality of endings and cinematics, and it's a nice kind of shove to get people to give it a go. For me, I'm more interested though in the new tools and features coming. As stated, they're bringing in some official modeling tools, which means we can mess directly with, as they say, the visuals, the animations, the sounds, even stats to completely overhaul the game. It almost sounds like a dev tool to control a lot of things and ultimately create new content and challenges from what's there for yourself. That's a fantastic thing for the lifeblood of the game long term, so pretty exciting. Not coming in patch 7 though, are two massive features that have been requested a lot since before the game even launched. That is crossplay to allow for console to PC or console to console play, as well as photo mode for the obvious reasons. The game is beautiful, a lot of it is seen from forced perspectives, so being able to freely look around like that to reveal some cool things maybe, but also just be a fun tool to play with, I'm expecting a lot of discussion and excitement around that when it does launch. But unfortunately, they say patch 7 will be too soon for those features. They've stated that there's a lot of work to actually implement those things. But it's still nice they've seen the call for them and are now working on them. Finally, really interestingly, there's going to be a closed beta test for patch 7 and you can assume future patches as well. We've not heard much about it, but a small sum of players are going to be able to play it early and provide feedback. Maybe the point is to help the new patches run smoother on launch. They usually have some new bugs. Every damn hot fix and major patch there's new trading bugs that we mess with so maybe this will help with that still the patch should only be a week or two away at this point so it's not like we're going to be missing out for long but with the patch 7 details discussed a bit how about a really cool look at the main menu the creator preza gaming videos posted this surprising footage of the main menu with a free cam to actually explore it revealing that it is not a flat background with some moving details on it but it is indeed a full 3d render with low quality for distant stuff trickery and perspective stuff but despite that it looks spotless a great use of the assets we see in game just organized for some interesting views and locations when it goes below you have the Baal temple which is very identifiable but to me this looks like an entirely new original location using the same assets from that place to match the vibe the adventurers who are walking down the stairs appear to be four original characters to my eyes anyway which is a bit of a shame because there was a lot of fun little theories about who they could be but above that you have the view of Baldur's gate as its own unique set piece to overlook the city there's actually a cave that just hangs below where we stand there as the perspective in the main menu and that's what we plunge down into as we go down to the Baal temple they went so hard on this specifically to create an actual tunnel that we actually go down to that set piece now the city itself is mostly a lot of floating buildings and a lot of reused assets positioned in different ways cleverly creating many streets to look like a city it's all floating in the air though hidden from the still perspective we're used to surprising details like say the water temple exists just in super low res but it's the same kind of shape and general outline but it's overall bewildering that they went so far for two menu backgrounds compared to just a 2d background you'd normally expect and that says it all for larian doesn't it whatever their two new projects actually are a lot of people are going to have their eyes on it moving on what about the most impactful item you can casually get right away in a new playthrough. I'm talking about an amulet that provides guidance. Guidance is the ridiculous spell that gives us that 1d4 to any and every ability check. Many dialogue roles need to happen throughout the course of this game and guidance is ideally used on all of them. It's obviously busted a little too strong. It does not work the same in D&D. &D. So having guidance in the party 
essentially becomes required. I can't live without it, and I think that's fair to say for most people. It kind of forces you to have a specific party, meaning there's at least one person with guidance in it at all times. Fortunately, there is an amulet that you can pick up in Act 1 that provides that divination cantrip for guidance. Literally the same guidance as the normal spell, meaning you do not need to run the specific classes that have guidance as long as someone's got this amulet equipped. The amulet is called the Silver Pendant, and it's found southwest of the Emerald Grove in Act 1. It's simply on a big hill you can climb up that I have completely missed for an ungodly amount of time. You just have to jump up a little bit, climb up some ledges, up a ladder, eventually you make it to the top where there's a skeleton laying down by a campfire. It has this pendant on it, so honestly, this might be the most valuable early game item overall, just for how helpful it is to not have to always run guidance on someone in the team and just rely on this amulet. Next, while we're thinking about early impact, here's an insane one. The Dark Urge can eat humanoid flesh. Yeah, unlike every other Origin character or custom character playthrough, the Dark Urge can do what they can't. Meaning, when you find the dwarf meat in the goblin camp, it can be eaten. Right at the entrance, there's a lot of cooked flesh, and some of it is labelled as dwarf. There's roasted dwarf belly, ribs, and legs, which are clearly easy to identify as dwarf. So because of that, any sane reasonable person would not eat that and cannot physically do it. But the dirge is far from normal. The Dark Urge can eat these, resulting in inspiration when you do and some concerning comments from the dirge. There are also a potential of between 4 to 16 healing each one you eat as a single use item that doesn't actually consume action or bonus actions when you do, which is wild. Basically, these roasted dwarf parts are a very useful tool that you can have with you for the entire run. Until whenever you decide you need a bit of healing that doesn't actually have any downsides or just intentional inspiration timing. So either way, it's pretty useful stuff that is unique to the Dark Urge. And yeah, I figure with all the new evil playthroughs that are going to be considered with Patch 7, this might be a handy, relevant tip. Now with that, if you are going to play the Dark Urge, I think it's commonly the case that you'll consider a sorcerer. So here's a simple trick to having infinite sorcery points to use. In Act 2, you can pick up the Shield of Devotion, which provides a level 1 spell slot when equipped. This means that when you're completely out of spell slots, you can still get one back by just equipping it, constantly restoring a spell slot to use for whatever purpose you want. The downside here is it is only a level 1 spell slot, but sorcerers can still make incredible use out of that by converting it into sorcery points. That's fantastic value, even though it's only a level 1 spell slot. Of course, there are many uses of level 1 spells that are still relevant in mid to late game for other playstyles, but I just think that infinite sorcery points, as an example, is probably the most impactful and useful. With those sorcery points, you can use it for all kinds of meta magic or yeah restoring spell slots so it becomes an infinite loop that you can rely on leading to higher level spell slot restores without having to rest this can be particularly useful you know in a challenge run or whatever it is you're doing and all it really takes is to get to act two and get that shield and then whenever you want to do that equip it unequip it re-equip it and in a very busted way get yourself infinite sorcery points all right, last up, pretty weird, but very helpful. A bug that might not survive patch seven, we'll have to see. You can give minions elixirs, which can massively boost their combat ability, that's for sure, just like your own. By highlighting your minion of choice and then opening up your party inventory screen, you can then choose whatever stuff's in your inventory, like consumables, such as potions, or more importantly, elixirs, and then drink them. As you can see, instead of you drinking it or whoever's actually holding it, the minion will drink it because you started by selecting it. And so with something potent like an elixir of bloodlust, you can have it so that your minion, when it kills an enemy, can gain temporary hit points and then an action. One of the strongest things we can use as an elixir in the game. Or as you can see, we can do other fun things like turn it invisible, which is fantastic. If it's the kind of minion that can, you know, fly, you could give it flight or maybe make it immune to fall damage. Whatever you can think of because there's so many good elixirs in the game. If you're going to go for a summon or minion based build of any kind, I think this is fantastic to know. Not to mention the potential healing from potions that can be a lifesaver for minions that they normally can't benefit from. But yeah, there's just a few hopefully impactful tips and things you might not have known. And on that note, is there anything you would suggest for this concept? We likely have a lot of new evil playthroughs coming in soon for patch 7. So what are the most useful tips and secrets that we could share with that in mind? So if we end up making a follow up video with that topic, I'll be sure to credit you if we talk about your suggestion. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice, to reiterate that it is nice, to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. 
is uh, goodbye. <laughs>